Hello, I'm Paddy Delaney, and welcome to Integrated Infrastructure, a podcast dedicated to bringing you news and views from industry leaders involved in the development, design, construction, and management of the many built forms that make up Australia's integrated infrastructure. This is episode 28 of Integrated Infrastructure, and in this podcast, I speak with Michael Edwards, CEO of the Gascoigne Gateway. The Gascoigne Gateway is a single jetty deep water port being developed just outside of Exmouth in Western Australia's Northwest Cape. This is such an interesting story. Mike is an ex-Royal Australian Navy clearance diver who's gone on to a successful career in maritime and port services. Mike and his associates have a very strong affinity with the northwest of Australia and the people who live there. The Gascoigne Gateway is a passion project and a labour of love. In this podcast, we talk about Mike's career in the Navy. We talk about the relationships he developed along the way and why he still works with so many of those people now. We discuss the Gascoigne region and specifically the town of Exmouth. We talk about the town's strengths, its challenges, and the need for more sustainable communities in these remote areas. We talk about how the project will support the town in creating jobs, not just in the delivery of the project, but in the operations and subsequent businesses that will be generated as a result. We talk about the incredibly positive environmental and sustainability impacts the project will have, not just on the marine environment, but also on things like the regeneration of boreholes through the development of a desalination plant to service the region. There is so much more to this podcast. Jump in and learn about a unique project under development in one of Australia's most remote regions. I hope you enjoyed this podcast. Please like, comment, share and subscribe if you do. So without any further ado, here's my conversation with Meg. Michael, welcome to Integrated Infrastructure. Um, it's great to have you on today. Um, in usual style, we always kick off with um, asking you to um, introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about you. So, um, yeah, thanks, yeah, go, go thanks, Patty. Uh, great, great to be here. Great to share, I guess, our story, which is very exciting. It certainly gets me up out of bed uh, early every morning and back in late, uh, but uh, all worth it, I think, in the end. Mm. Um, you know, seeing this uh, project of uh, real regional significance and making uh, massive differences to both uh, the environmental future of the area, but also for the community and uh, the social benefits there. My background, um, I've been in the commercial marine space, port space for the last 17 years. Prior to that, uh, I ran away from home and joined the Navy as a 17 and three quarter year old uh, chap having uh, finished high school and uh, went off to see the world. Uh, that did take me to many places over that 25-year career in which I um, qualified uh, ultimately as a Navy clearance diver um, and that enabled me to uh, roam around to places such as uh, East Timor ultimately, uh, mm-hmm. uh, the Afghan uh, conflict, uh, Iraq and uh, several other deployments around the world including two years in the US and uh six months in the uh, the UK. So, yeah. uh, you know, wonderful friendships formed, but uh, enduring uh, relationships with people that are like-minded, that have a team focus uh, and are hell-bent on delivering things. So I've surrounded myself with those people in this project uh, with Gascoigne mm. Gateway, our, our chief operating officer is also a clearance diver, uh, one of the, the other founder and... Uh, uh, I guess my business colleague of many years, also a clearance diver. So uh, I guess understanding uh, that you have a, a business or uh, you're chasing a uh, an outcome and you're able to surround yourself with people that once upon a time, I guess you still can, you actually had faith that they would watch you back and save your life. Yeah, right. You must all have a very uh, keen in, keen eye for risk and uh, mitigating that and understanding, uh, you know, um, or, or the implications and all the rest of it. I think I think you're right there, Patty. Um, the, I mean, risk risk is all around us, of course. Yeah. Uh, and being able to both identify it and then uh, manage it, either by mitigation or, or or even accepting the risk, is just what we do from day to day. Uh, mm-hmm. And we do bring that to the fore here. We do um, have, sorry, we've we, we brought a background where we've seen extreme risk 
um, you know, the battle space um, to crossing a road uh, and avoiding traffic and everything mm -hmm. in between that. And so I think in that context, we understand uh, the most extreme uh, effects of, uh, of risk when it goes bad uh, and then uh, able to uh, apply all those lessons and understanding of where it sits in, mm. in uh, achieving your outcome. So it's, it's, it's good. It's been a great background. Yeah, absolutely. How did that background then lead into into sort of the, into you know city life and the commercial world? Uh, very difficult, I think. And uh, as I guess, and I don't want to digress, but as it's being played out in the veteran space now with. Uh, with you know a suicide rate of double um, double the uh, civilian population for veterans uh, and the extremes you know the the, the, the uh, suicide rate for people in inside and serving is half that of the general population but then when they depart it doubles so there's some there's, there's real uh, distinct uh, lines to be drawn there and that's a great concern to us. So we actually start our own uh, trust and non-for-profit uh, about 10 years ago, the Navy Clearance Diving Trust, mm. uh, where we're trying to make differences, and particularly in the transition piece, to ensure that we're cap capturing all those people that you know, depart the services and in a very high focus uh, place mm. uh, and then move and transition into a civilian world. And I guess for some, the bridge can be too far. You know, you're going mm. from very, very tight groups, very, very focused uh, activity to something that probably what I'm doing now, which is, yeah. you know, arguably a little bit more mundane, you know, sitting in an office drinking uh, lattes and uh, you're running through spreadsheets and signing documents sort of thing. So, yeah, yeah great extremes. But I digress. <laughs> No, that's all right. No, it's interesting. I appreciate you sharing that. Um, the, um, the, the 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 progression into sort of professional life. What's that last seventeen years been 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 like, and and how's that sort of um, driven you to the to to? Um, we haven't mentioned it yet. The Gascoigne Gateway Project. Um, you know, um, yeah, yeah. The, so the segue into Gascoigne Gateway was that seventeen years post naval service where I left, um, and I guess I reached a um, it was a watershed moment. The fork in the road. Do I mm. continue in a, in a career uh, where I'd had sea command and you know second command, one of the largest ships in the navy, and was moving down the pathway? Uh, however, it just it just comes a time when you must make these decisions. My decision was drawn by an opportunity over in Western Australia where I came and joined uh, my long term uh, business mate. And um, we cracked on with a, a company that delivered port uh, operational uh, management uh, capability to the West Australian um, uh, environment, to the West Australian Government, Department of Defence, and now that's sort of grown to a certain degree, now delivering things in Northern Territory, South Australia, uh, and continuing on in Western Australia, plus some overseas forays. Um, so that built uh, an experience base over the last 17 years uh, that ranged from operations uh, to, uh, to the risk environment, uh, to consulting, to design, to optimisation of marine uh, infrastructure uh, and operations. Um, so a natural segue there that whilst we were going through that journey, we were able to look at uh, various opportunities that we could really bring our skill sets to the fore. So mm -hmm. fast forward Gascoigne Gateway, where we were operating and continue to do so, uh, providing services for a major, uh, uh, a major mining firm uh, in the northwest uh, and, and in particular in the Gascoigne region of Western Australia. So this uh, Gascoigne uh, uh, region is sparsely populated uh, with small townships and small, uh, really um, almost on the cusp of unsustainability sometimes. And so that's always resonated for us. So we've been on the ground and working in these communities, in particular one in Carnarvon, Western Australia, for the last 16, nearly 17 years. Um, we have had close integration with uh, the local populace. We understand the sensitivities of those small communities. We understand uh, what's essential to maintain their sustainability um, and ensuring that their economic health is there, 
uh, but also those long-term multi-generational impacts for, for education, for careers and for health outcomes. Uh, we've got a great understanding of that, I believe, uh, and it's certainly been the, the major driver in ensuring that we bring infrastructure to a place that not only needs it, but gets it in the right form. I mean, anyone can roll out a single jetty that has a single offtake that's offloading something you dig out of the ground or put a hole in the ground and, and some liquid spurts forward, right? I think that's, uh, apart from the technical piece, I don't think that takes too much cerebral um, energy to, to, to come up with that. Fast forward Gascoigne Gate where we're, we've determined that what we're providing to that community, and I'm talking about eight and a half kilometres south of the township, mm. uh, that we're providing something that is multi-generational. We're providing a marine piece of infrastructure that with $350 million total project cost at the moment, that that enduring 100-year piece of infrastructure provides for the community and the people in that uh, community multi-generational outcomes in career structures, and the associated health, education, and so forth. Yeah. T -t Tell us about Exmouth then. Where, where, where are they at today in, in sort of, you know, the focus in on, on, on that town? And um, what, 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 what's the nature of the town now? What, what, what are their needs? What, you know, what, what's it all about? Uh, Patty, a very good question and one that's been asked of me quite often and, and one that I can roll off, uh, you know, the correct response. Mm. Uh, a town of 2,500 people, uh, it's uh, been there, well, it started World War II was the first sort of incursion there, if you like, where it was supporting submarines uh, and a RAF airbase, uh, RAAF, that is. Mm. And... Uh, Come fast forward in the 60s, uh, fishing, particularly prawn trawling, came to the town and uh, then the uh, US Navy and Australian Navy uh, built a, a very low frequency transmission station out at uh, Northwest Cape for, uh, to communicate with um, our submarines uh, and then ongoing extensions of the RWF uh, RAF Learmont base. Mm. Uh, which is currently a bare base sort of concept, albeit, you know, over 3,000 uh, metres long, that runway. So it's one of the most capable airstrips in Australia. Mm. So uh, it's probably 20%, 15% to 20% reliant on defence to support the town. So that's probably the only stable piece of it because the rest of the town relies on tourism. So it's about 80% mm. supported by tourism. And as you would imagine with tourism, it is not only seasonal in the context of Exmouth where it gets quite warm uh, through summer, um, but there's a range of tourism activity and uh, uh, the spend is also quite diverse. You know, your, your uh, grey nomads or your happy wanderers, however you want to refer to them, come in and they have a certain spending trait. Uh, backpackers also have a certain spending trait. Mm. Uh, and and they also have impacts both on the township and environment, uh, independent, good or bad. I'm not, I'm not here to make that determination, but the point is there is an enduring tourism piece in Exmouth. However, uh, as COVID showed, when, when the state of Western Australia was shut down and intrastate uh, movements were stopped for uh, uh, quite a long time. Uh, the town basically shut down. So no economic activity or very, very little. Uh, and then, of course, when it was opened up again, absolutely overwhelmed, like a 2,500-person uh, town uh, ramped up to, anecdotally, I've heard 20,000 people wow. nassed on to the northwest Cape. Uh, utilising uh, Exmouth as the base, obviously, in a very short period. So the town absolutely overwhelmed. And, of course, that has massive ramifications to um, how we uh, or the impacts on the environment, and I'm not talking just the marine environment, the terrestrial environment, uh, roads, uh, you know, camping sites and so forth and so on, uh, the water sources uh, and usage rates go up. You know, there's... It is a very broad uh, impact and mm. something that we're very uh, focused on in making sure that whatever we're doing has the ability to, I guess, um, uh, 
uh, tailor some of that uh, impact that future uh, tourism might make to the region. Mm. I mean, you, you made, um, we, we talked before, didn't we, um, just to sort of preparing for this, and you mentioned the impact even just trying to get a doctor's appointment. Yeah, indeed, and, and I've had that come to me from uh, someone in the community suggesting that, you know, when the influx and the, the peak of tourism's on, uh, it takes uh, like five weeks for someone to see a GP mm. in, in a normal appointment sort of uh, movement. So... Yeah, it's uh, as we refer to uh, the golden handcuffs of tourism. You know, they look very pretty. You put them on, they're fine, but after a while, they uh, start to wear you, wear you down. Yeah, and 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 you and you mentioned that because the the the, the size of the town on the on on the, on the non tourism times, they they can't. Um, you know, the education is an issue in, in terms of um, um, not being able to have a sustainable school or, um, um, you know, p- permanent teacher and all that sort of stuff at the moment. Uh, the school, yeah. I guess at the end of the day, um, what we need to achieve for any community in, in, in Australia and Western Australia in particular here is uh, the ability to deliver a first-class education outcome. Uh, in country towns all around the state, you know, that's always under duress uh, because resources aren't necessarily there. We, we sort of know that. We, we want to all put, I'll put it to you and analogise it. Do you get the same level of outcome? Uh, and I'm generally speak here for some young lady who's attending a Methodist Ladies College in Claremont mm. uh, versus someone who's doing their matriculation in front of a computer in Exmouth. Mm. Um, that's, that's the sort of point I'm making. I'm not suggesting that it's, there aren't great people that are delivering the best they can and, and mm. there's good outcomes. I'm just wanted to give you that real uh, yeah, sure. schism of, um, mm. you know, the extremes, it's there. So mm. uh, to deliver the best we possibly can um, in that state-run um, educational piece, we, we do need to make sure that there is a sustainable uh, population base mm. that ticks the right box for the education department to bring in the right resources because it's all based about heads on seats, yeah? um, bottoms on seats. So your resource base is based around the numbers of teachers, uh, the amount of money that's given to the school to run itself and all those sorts of things. Uh, by getting that base load of students up to the right number means it's obviously flow on benefits. Because mm-hmm. it, you, it's sort of a vicious circle otherwise, isn't it? Because people have to make tough decisions about whether they leave the town and then that that, that just means that headcount gets reduced and therefore you never quite can You're ch- chasing its tail consistently to be able to grow um, and, and get, to a, get to that point that you're looking for without your project. Spot on, Patrick, spot on. Yeah, it is a downward spiral and uh, um, I, I think uh, the delivery, just, just through having transient populations as well, so someone needs to take their child down and go, you know what, I want to give them the best possible outcomes. I'm going down to Perth. I'm going to leave this job here, sell my house because I have to, mm-hmm. and transit down to Perth. So that has ramifications, not just mm-hmm. the family, of course, but the, the, whole, uh, the whole community ultimately. Yeah. Give us an idea about how just how remote this this place Exmouth is, and into because we when you actually start talking about the the distances between it and Carnarvon and, and other places, it, it, it's it's for anybody listening to that that this they can start to imagine, you know, the scale that we're talking about. Yeah, indeed. And I was just looking at the uh, electoral map um, only yesterday uh, that that showed that uh, the. Uh, the seat of Durac, uh, that Melissa, the Honourable Melissa Price, Minister of Defence Industry, currently is the local member, mm. uh, constitutes about 20% of the Australian mainland. <coughs> yeah, right. Okay. Uh, <laughs> is that right? 20% of the mainland. Crikey. It, it is absolutely massive. And, uh, you know, when you consider that Western Australia uh, represents 30% of the mainland itself, uh, it, it's it's really incredible the, the context. You know, you're looking at, you know, Melbourne to Sydney is to uh, Brisbane, you know, about a thousand kilometres. It's uh, from Perth to Exmouth, 1300 kilometres. Yeah. And then you've still got two and a half thousand kilometres above that going up the north coast. Uh, the Exmouth piece, uh, we, we're actually sitting on the most, um, one of them that's not the most western part 
uh, north-south. However, it is the most extreme part of mainland Australia, jutting into the Indian Ocean. So we're the closest point of mainland Australia to Sunda Strait, uh, Christmas Island, Cocos Island, Diego Garcia, uh, mm. and 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 that does put a real strategic uh, piece on this. Uh, puts us under the microscope for what it can uh, deliver. Obviously, even the defence context, but mm. the freight and logistics piece. You know, when we're trying to shorten uh, freight delivery times, shipping, and those sorts of things. Perfect. Tell us about the project. Let's get into the meat and bones of this, and 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 des- describe you know describe the project I- itself. Yeah, certainly. So, um, Gascoigne Gateway, we're, we're delivering a multi-use facility, a uh, 100-year-plus project. Um, <clears throat> however, it's it's quite simple in its, you know, it's, it's construction and it's deliverable to peace. It's a single jetty, uh, 900 metres or thereabouts into uh, the, the Gulf, so not on the reef side. It's actually in coastal waters, uh, going out 900 metres, uh, a very small dredging piece uh, to allow ships to come to their uh, uh, their required depth, servicing around five berths. So that gives it the multi-use capability so that we don't build a white elephant mm-hmm. and that we're able to maximise both the use and the usability of uh, the infrastructure, providing the diversity that ensures that it's uh, financially viable for us to actually invest but it also ensures that that community, and I'll go back to where we first started off, you know, single, almost single reliance on tourism just doesn't cut the mustard if you want mm. a sustainable community and environment. So we're providing the ability to basically uh, calm down the troughs and peaks uh, and ensure that there's a year-long uh, income stream whilst diversifying the skill sets and job opportunities to that community. We'll be delivering 70 to 75 full-time jobs once we're fully up and running. And, (coughs) pardon me, uh, there's an associated 130 jobs that have been identified in the community that are directly attributable. So bringing 200 full-time jobs into that community of 2,600 is a significant change um, and the the deliverables and the impact uh, Long term, are multi generational. We're giving mm. opportunities to those kids that currently have to leave town to find uh, employment, unless you want to be probably, and I generalise here, you know, a barista in a cafe or on a whale shark uh, decky or something like that. Mm. You know, there's very limited um, uh, opportunities. And this is what's the feedback we get from the community. Yeah, and so so I suppose if we maybe if I ask you where do those jobs come from, then we can learn about all the different facets to this project because there are so many of them, aren't there? In terms of what, what you're you're not just creating a jetty. There's there's so in terms of infrastructure, there's so much more there that's going to need people and you know create jobs and, and all that sort of stuff. Yeah, indeed. I think uh, what what the most uh, important aspect of this thing is its impact on the environment and Mm. we have a vision to be the greenest port on earth. Mm. Ambitious, yes. Uh, Achievable, absolutely. Uh, Mm. Because everything we're doing is from first principle. We're not chasing down the route that generally is happening in the rest of the world where a port's been there for 100 years, in some instances a 1,000 years, uh, uh, and then there's plug-ins, okay, we're going to try and make it carbon neutral, so electric vehicles, uh, and hybrid this and that sort of thing. We've got the capability here mm. where we'll be an exemplar in the future. We'll showcase technology um, and innovation in that marine sec- sector, which will create this carbon neutral facility that is in balance with the environment, uh, providing that community to thrive, but actually leaving it. And this is the, this is the absolute gem because it's not greenwash. It's not ticking environmental boxes. That has to happen anyway, yeah? Mm. This is leaving it regenerational. So science-backed, science understanding that we leave that environment better than we found it. That's Mm. the future, and that's what we're delivering. Uh, We've got a range of um, initiatives that all, they're all part of our OPEX, and and I'll just throw one out there. So Mm. from day one, we're looking at regener- uh, uh, renewable power, okay? Mm-hmm. So we can do that. Now, what does that provide? If we've got, we've got lots of land, 320-plus days of sunshine a year, 
we have the ability to roll out our own power. So straight away, uh, we're not you, you know we're not uh, producing carbon um, or, or you know um, additional carbon mm-hmm. uh, that the town currently relies on. But with that renewable, we also are able to produce potable water mm-hmm. from those osmosis. So that absolutely relieves our reliance on drawing off groundwater, mm-hmm. and the the World Heritage uh, Park that is the Cape Range National Park actually is uh, a World Heritage listed park predominantly because it has a limestone cast system, which is the um, uh, the aquifers, and they've got a range of different uh, unique fauna down there that have mm. been declared uh, environmentally sensitive and important. That's why it's World Heritage. Mm. Uh, so we don't want to impact that. What we want to do is make water for ourselves so that we don't impact from day one but in a scalable way, end up providing water to the town, world standard water rather than all water. Um, so it relieves the pressure on those in that environment underground and then it can recharge itself. So I'll go back to my statement about the regenerational piece. Mm. The regenerational piece for us is leaving it better than we found it. Mm. Uh, mm. And, and we are running down the pathway of having science uh, uh, verify that impact, and it will mm. be. Mm. We're, I mean, we're not only social animals, but we're also very tightly sensitised to that community, having worked there for, you know, nine on 20 years. Mm. Um, so not only do we have reputational stuff, we have our own, you know, ethical standards, and that is we want to leave a legacy for our children mm. in a better place. This is the most best way we think we can do it. Yeah, and and you mentioned um, before sort of um, utilising um, uh, waste to energy, um, sort of technology to make sure that you're not creating a landfill problem with all this extra traffic coming through, um, which is going to create energy in itself as well. Um, there's multiple solutions that that are going to create jobs and 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 um, um, and, and boost that economy. Indeed, um, creating a whole range of um, new opportunities for, for the kids or the future generations. And you're right about, you know, the landfill is across the road for us, um, desperate for a solution on that. And mm. for us being able to spend money, I guess, and to understand and uh, come up with solutions on that waste to energy piece mm. and feed it into the mix that ultimately will, or we hope that we're able to contribute greatly to the power needs of that town to make yeah. it a renewable town wholesale. Yeah. Um, that, that's where we see the, the future. You know, just reducing a, a small part of the current trucking needs, for example, between mm. Fremantle and uh, the Pilbara. If, and I'll, I'll, these are fairly broad figures, uh, but if we were able to just reduce, say, 5% of the 6.4 million tonnes of cargo that goes by road to the Pilbara every year, that would reduce 120,000 tonnes of carbon off the road. Mm. These are just broad figures that uh, we've been looking at. Uh, Obviously, part of our carbon audit will discover what that really means. So there's probably a lot of upside on that. But, um, you know, this facility has capacity to drive regional development for tourism, defence, horticulture, exports, rare earth and battery minerals. Uh, other mineral concentrates, freight and logistics, uh, um, uh, Australian border force, uh, super yachts, so uh, getting that ecotourism going. It, it is, it is it's a very broad uh, uh, remit, um, mm. but it's essential and it, it, it will deliver what we're suggesting uh, and planning to do. That's fantastic, and and um, and, and even just the the, the the amount of things that um, that this the, the positive outcomes you're saying where where boats are currently their anchors are damaging reef and, and what have you. What you're actually doing is, is is by bringing them into the port, you're reducing the damage that's being done in in the ocean as well. That, that's absolutely right, Paddy. The uh, and this is when I go back to everything being scientifically verifiable or based mm-hmm. and studied. Um, there's a paper that's. Uh, out for peer review at the moment that is citing um, this and this is scientifically achieved through AIS you know GPS positioning mm. of ships. Um, and when that's ex- extrapolated the amount of vessels over 50 metres that spend more than 24 hours there obviously at anchor within the Exmouth Gulf already which is 
uh, I must say it is coastal waters. It's not in the marine park. Um, but within that, that bay, that, that gulf, there is close to, close to 9 million square metres of seabed impact through anchoring. Mm. and vessel anchoring every year. Most of it happens because there isn't a facility in which to bring ships alongside to do the things they need to do. So by, the, by virtue of the fact that we're actually producing infrastructure that enables them to come and do their things alongside in a more safe environment, a mm. more environmentally friendly environment, um, that, that will absolutely reduce and verifiably reduce ongoing uh, and ultimately increasing um, potential damage to that seabed from the, the anchors and the chains that are, uh, that are, that are being used annually. Um, it's, it's quite incredible, you know, when you, because, of course, we're going down where we need to at this stage look at the baseline. You know, if we're going to actually verify our regenerative capabilities, we've got a you know, baseline where everything at is that. Uh, but if you go down there and you stand on the beach, you, go, you look out there, it's very easy for you to go, oh, this is such a wonderful, pristine environment without any damage. It's only when you start doing scientific studies and you understand what's what's actually there under, yeah. you know, under, under the, the doona, so to speak, yeah. uh, that you understand you do have um, a, a challenge on um, and that fortunately what we're planning because we've been able to discover these things, will leave that regenerative and positive impact on the environment. Mm. Uh, you know, the restoration will happen over time. We're all part of that. I think as a community we have responsibility, but as a company we have a, a, a much higher responsibility. Yeah, fantastic. It's really good. And so what, where are you up to at the moment? What, what, what stage are you at? When are you, when are you hoping to... Um, I don't know. I don't know if, if putting a, a spade in the ground is the first stage, or whether you what, what the process is. But um, yeah, where, where are things um, at at the moment? Uh, we're going through our definitive feasibility study at the moment. The project's been alive for about three and a half years, mm -hmm. uh, uh, going hard, building up our team, uh, our capabilities. Obviously, capital is important for these projects. Mm -hmm. Uh, ensuring that our stakeholders are engaged along the way is important too and getting feedback. We've just finished um, and continue to conduct a range of community reference groups. So we're actually engaging um, two groups in this case uh, and they've been set aside. There's about 45 people all up from the community that put their hand up and wanted to play. Um, so we're looking at environment and design as one group. This is where... Uh, People from the community come in, look at our design, uh, have input about the environmental impacts or, or potential impacts, uh, see how we can tweak the design, if you like, from this conceptual stage uh, for benefit of community environment, etc. And then we've got another group that we engage with uh, frequently that is uh, providing the input into the jobs and industry piece uh, of where we go. So, you know, local content, particularly during construction, but then again ongoing, you know, we're 100 years plus, as I said, uh, ensuring that our, in, our impacts in that community or our, our uh, contribution to that community is maximised for the benefit of that community. Um, we're, we're not planning on fly and fly out uh, arrangements at all. We see this um, as, as just interwoven. It's meshed into that community and... I, and I, I do wax about this occasionally, but I'm really enthused by looking at one day where I walk into the school at um, Exmouth and I'm able to look at someone and go, yes, young lady, you're taking my job over in 25 years as CEO. Um, I think that that's sort of real uh, palpable uh, outcomes that I really want to see. I love it. Absolutely love it. It's so great to talk to somebody so passionate and who's, who's got a vision and, and trying to make something happen for a community and for the environment as well. It's, uh, it's, it's great to hear, Michael, and really appreciate you uh, you coming on and telling telling us your story. And, and I've um, I've known you for a week now and um, what, well, well, since Tuesday anyway, we had our first chat and um, I know how hard you're working because you've been to Canberra and to Sydney and now you're back in Perth this morning. So um, it's a, it's a labour of love, isn't it? Oh, it is, and, uh, you know, I'm just one of the team, obviously. I've got 
uh, there's about uh, five full time uh, working here and, and uh, a range of other people in supporting factors. And you know, they're it's just magic. It's magic when you're able to pull an A class team together. I've got a we've got a board of directors that are just uh, all over this. They are passionate. They want to see it happen. Mm. Uh, they're delivering well above. Um, you know the, the, what what would be expecting the norm, um, and that, that's that legacy piece. You know our COO has openly said to us, and I was able to basically poach him from another organisation. Yes, he is a clearance diver, so there was a there was a nice lever there, but you know it resonates in me that he said I could go and continue working where I'm doing it, and at the end of the day, my kids would say, "So what did you do, Dad?" Mm. Oh, I did this, you know, and I was in this um, uh, mechanical business or, or doing this sort of stuff. But when I go to Gascoigne Gateway and my kids say, what did you do? But he can sit there with a kid, his grandkids on his lap saying, well, guess what? I brought Gascoigne Gateway, a piece of multi-generational, environmentally improving infrastructure uh, to the world that is basically... Uh, you know, reducing our carbon footprint, saving saving our planet, uh, at least for our contribution to it, mm. and making a change so that that grandchild and that refers back to me. Whether it's a CYO kind of moment, that's probably a little bit uh, beyond the beyond the realm. But uh, I, I guess you can see my point there that someone's jumped on board us because they've they've seen the vision, they understand actually actually what we want to achieve, so yeah. that. That, that fills me with good feeling. Oh, I love it. I absolutely love it. Look, I, um, we, we always finish the podcast with the question of what are you excited about at the moment? What are you looking forward to? But um, I don't, I, I, it's quite clear what you're looking forward to. But give us what's what's your next your sort of, you know, your next goal post, as it were, your next, um, you know, staging post that, um, uh, you know, that you, you, you're, you're excited about and aiming to get to. Yeah. Um, you probably skirted back to the original question, which was, uh, yeah, where are you at with the project? Um, yeah. uh, you know, there's this capital uh, that we are continuing to raise to, to make this realised. Uh, the stakeholder engagement is uh, big. So we've got um, yeah, massive support from the both federal and the state government. Mm. Uh, we believe overwhelming support of that uh, community that want to see this happen, of course. Um, now we've got to bring that together. Um, go through all the feed studies, of course. Um, ensure that our procurement piece is, is is the right fit, and that we've got the right partners delivering this into the future. Um, and then, you know, taking that community along for the uh, uh, for the journey with us is is vital. If you know that excitement for me is is seeing this obviously finished. Uh, and when I say finish, construction finish and in operation, mm. but that's, that's enduring because I'm, I'm never going to see this thing finished. Oh, mm. I'll be long gone and, and I'll be worm, worm poo, as it were. You'll be regenerated. Uh, yeah, I'll be, <laughs> I'll be regenerating <laughs> the environment. Uh, no, I think um, I, I want to I realise this vision for all people that are part of our team that have been driving, you know, beyond their... Uh, their, their expect our expectations to see this because they get it um, and they see the finish the, the vision. I want, I want to see them realise realise the dream as well. I think that's important. Mm. All, all our investors uh, are all over. This. So it's not it's not a monetary thing for our investors. They, they want to see this realised for our nation, mm. uh, but but for the planetary uh, outcomes also. Amazing. Fantastic, um, Michael. I've um, I've so enjoyed um, uh, listening to your story and hearing about the project, and I really hope you're going to come and tell us, you know, more about it as you progress through your journey, and um, and you know, we might even get to talk about it being built and all the rest of it. So um, that that would be fantastic. So th- thank you so much for coming on the podcast today, uh, Patty. Thanks for the opportunity. Of course, it's it's been wonderful chatting to you. Um, we, we have got a, a story to tell. Uh, and sharing it with you, um, all that does is just keeps me going for another day, right? Fantastic. I look forward well, to the next opportunity. You uh, do keep going, so uh, congratulations, and um, we'll talk again. Tremendous. Thank you. Integrated Infrastructure is powered by North Search, specialists in executive and technical search across engineering, design, construction, property, and energy markets in Australia. If you'd like to find out more about North Search or get involved with this podcast, 
you can click on the links in the show notes or email me directly at the address on the screen. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Integrated Infrastructure. Please tell your friends and colleagues if you did, and we hope to see you again soon.